Hello, my name is John Dench from the Broad Institute, and today I'll be talking about uh, recent work developing base header technology for pooled screens in mammalian cells. So a mainstay of, of uh, working with CRISPR technology in mammalian cells is pooled screening. Pooled screening begins with the synthesis of oligonucleotides, uh, cloning that pool of oligos into a plasmid, uh, producing lentivirus, and then delivering that pool of lentivirus into a population of cells, applying some sort of uh, selective pressure, uh, followed by isolation of genomic DNA, PCR to retrieve the guides, Illumina sequencing to read out those PCR, products, and then finally, uh, de sequence deconvolution and, and calling of hits based on what guide RNAs enriched or depleted uh, given, the, given the selective pressure. Uh, generally, we approach these at the Broad in our platform, uh, dividing this up into, into two parts. The parts that, in, that are highlighted here in blue are the parts that we execute, uh, because these are things that are done uh, very well at scale. Uh, however, the parts in, in red tend to be those that are very specialized to the question of interest. So those are the, the aspects that are executed by our collaborators. Uh, in the year 2019, uh, we did an awful lot of these screens. We did an awful lot of them in 2020 as well, though a little bit less due to the pandemic. Uh, we made over 150 customized pools, uh, 14 liters of lentivirus, an awful lot of alumina lanes, and probably most importantly, collaborated with well over 100 PIs, both at the Broad uh, and in the broader scientific community. But what I'm gonna talk about today uh, is actually work where we did the, the parts in red, again, to develop base editors uh, for uh, pooled, pooled screening. Uh, so the great part about, about these genetic screens is that you can really mix and match all the different parts of the perturbation, the selective pressure, and the readout. Uh, conventionally or in initially, CRISPR screens were done by a knockout, but there's been many, many uh, developments uh, subsequently, CRISPR activation, CRISPR-I, uh, a whole bunch of other ways of, of regulating genes epigenetically. Uh, Cas12a has been developed for uh, screens and I think works particularly well when, when one doing combinatorics. Uh, and then finally, base editing. Uh, so I'm gonna, the results I'm gonna talk today are mostly uh, covered in this publication, although there will be some unpublished results uh, towards the end. So base editors, uh, just briefly, uh, the basic idea is that you have Cas9 and you're using, in this case, a Nicase version of Cas9, so it only cuts one strand, but does not generate a double strand DNA break. And then one appends to Cas9 uh, different domains that allows one to do chemistry uh, on the actual DNA bases. Uh, the, the version that we've been working with or that I'm gonna present here is the BE3 architecture where an APABEC domain on the N-terminus and a UGI domain on the C-terminus allows for the introduction of C to T edits uh, in the mammalian genome. And this is from a very nice review uh, from Holly Reese and David Blue of a couple of years ago. So the first question we wanted to ask is, well, how well do these base editors work in, in mammalian cells in this screening setting? Uh, so we developed a lentivirus that expresses both the guide RNA and the BE3.9 max architecture. Uh, and we, for, a, for a benchmarking purposes, we made a library where we had a whole bunch of guide RNAs that either targeted essential genes or non-essential genes. And to look to see how well we were performing, uh, we defined true positives as guide RNAs that are predicted to introduce splice site or nonsense mutations in essential genes, and true negatives as guide RNAs that introduce either silent mutations or no edits in those same essential genes. And the results of that benchmarking is plotted here, uh, where the, one can calculate the area under the curve. Uh, now, a perfect area under the curve would be 1.0, and we're not there. Uh, so certainly, uh, one takeaway from this is that you know, there are false negatives, just as there are in, in any other screening approach, and we shouldn't ignore that. However, the question of course, remains, well, what can we do with the technology given this level of performance? Uh, so the, one, one of the first things we did was look at small molecule protein interactions. So we made a library of guide RNAs uh, that tiled across the gene MCL1. This is an anti-apoptotic gene uh, that, is, that is very important in uh, numerous cancers. Uh, so we took Meljuso cells and melanoma line. We introduced this library where, again, there's every possible guide RNA targeting MCL1. And then we treated the cells, or we split them into three different arms. First is a control. Now, since MCL1 itself is not essential to survival in these cells, regardless of the edit, uh, the cells should continue to proliferate. However, when we add in a BCL2-like one inhibitor, we expect the cells to die. And that's because MCL1 and BCL2-like one are a very well-validated synthetic lethal gene pair. So if you have one or the other, the cell is fine. However, if both of them are gone, then the cell is dead. So any, uh, any guide RNA that introduced a loss of function mutation into MCL1 should deplete in this condition relative to this condition. 
And then finally, uh, we screened with both a BCL2 like one inhibitor and an MCL1 inhibitor. So in this case, if the guide RNA is introduced in edit whereby MCL1 still maintains its activity so that it doesn't die in the presence of the BCL2 like one inhibitor, but cannot be inhibited by the MCL1 inhibitor, then those should survive. So this is a drug resistance arm, essentially. So what do the results look like? Well, first you can see, uh, so plotted on the x-axis is their depletion in just the BCL2 like one inhibitor arm. Uh, and on the y-axis is when with the dual inhibitor. So first uh, we do see that we have uh, numerous mutations where the cells are sensitive to the BCL2 like one inhibitor. So we've classified these as likely loss of function alleles of MCL1. And likewise, dots up here are those that are resistant to, to the MCL1 inhibitor. So to give us, so we're gonna, uh, just to walk through the validation step, uh, we're gonna, I'm gonna show an example of one of these. Uh, with these base editor screens, validation is, I mean, it's always important regardless of the kind of screen you're doing, but especially in these base editor screens. That's because when doing a, again, a traditional CRISPR knockout screen, uh, you can, if you, if a couple of guides score in your screen, you can always go back and validate with even more guide RNAs. Uh, and, and see that, okay, you know, lots of different guide RNAs when I target a gene, uh, give me this phenotype. But with a CRISPR base editor screen, the hit is almost always a single guide RNA. Uh, so you can't just, you know, beat, beat this down with numbers. You can't just screen more guide RNAs. So the validation path is more essential. Uh, so to do that, we tweak the, the screen system a little bit. Now we're introducing individual guide RNAs into a population of cells and adding our, our selective pressure, in this case, the small molecule inhibitors. But now rather than PCRing and sequencing out the guide, which there's, since there's only one guide, we wouldn't learn very much. Uh, now we're actually PCR, uh, PCRing and, and sequencing the target locus of so the endogenous uh, genomic DNA. And we're looking to see what alleles enrich or deplete over time. And here's an example of, of what that looks like. So this is the target site for a particular guide RNA. And we can see how, and these are all the different alleles that this particular base editor generates. And you see there's a fair amount of diversity. Uh, you know, in, in sometimes, you know, these three Cs are edited. Sometimes these three Cs are edited to Ts. Uh, we do occasionally see C to non-T editing, which uh, from the standpoint of it just producing uh, more, more alleles with, with unique amino acid substitutions, it's actually, I, I'd argue, more of a feature than a bug. Uh, but essentially, we can just say, well, okay, you know, what are the alleles that enrich? Uh, what are the alleles that, that deplete? And then translate that uh, into, into amino acid space. And in this particular case, we can see that every allele that has the A220C, A227B mutation enriched in the presence of the two small molecule inhibitors. Uh, whereas this T226M mutation, uh, sometimes it comes along for the ride, but clearly it's not causal. Uh, because here's an example of an allele that only has this A227B mutation and it enriches. Uh, quite nicely, we do see one example where there's an A227B mutation uh, that does not enrich, but uh, in that same allele uh, just downstream, there's a stop codon. So this we would predict to be a loss of function allele uh, rather than a drug resistant uh, mutation. And then when we look, and, and so first on, on the left, uh, those are those same data, but now uh, sort of from an allele perspective. And we see that when we uh, add in the bcl 2 like one inhibitor uh, only, uh, the cells are fine. Uh, however, when we add in both the, both the small molecules, uh, now we see a clear enrichment of, of this allele. And when one looks at the crystal structure, you see that the A227 mutation, or the A227 uh, amino acid is right in the binding pocket for this small molecule. So it makes sense that changing this to a larger amino acid uh, gives, uh, gives some measure of, of drug resistance. Now, you may have noticed uh, that there were some two dots over here, uh, which we certainly didn't ex expect to find. Uh, and these are rather strange. These are loss of function alleles uh, that are rescued by the MCL1 inhibitor. So again, these two dots, when we only add in the BCL2 like one inhibitor, the cells are dead. Uh, so they're, they're on the left here, but that effect is rescued when we add in the MCL1 inhibitor. Now that's not obviously apparent uh, how that would occur, but this is uh, an effect that we can validate by looking at the, uh, again, doing that same experiment of, of putting in individual guides and looking at the, at the different alleles. Uh, when we have this G217K mutation, uh, only in the presence of the BCL2 like one inhibitor, it, it rapidly uh, depletes. However, uh, it, is, it is maintained and maybe even enriches a little bit when we add in the MCL1 inhibitor. Uh, same is true for, for the other guide RNA, same trend. Uh, now, I have no idea what this means. So basically tweeted out help 
uh, and some uh, new friends from Australia. In fact, the, some of the folks who were on this paper that described this MCL1 inhibitor in the first place, the S63845 molecule, uh, are very interested in, in uh, working with us uh, to figure out what's going on. Now, MCL1, uh, just to throw out a few hypotheses, MCL1 is actually exists in both a pro and an anti-apoptotic form. Uh, the anti-apoptotic is the more conventional one, but there are splice isoforms. Uh, that lead to uh, the, essentially the function of MCL1 reversing. So it might be the case uh, that uh, these mutations are mimicking or even inducing perhaps uh, different splice isoforms, uh, in which case now the small molecule serves as an inhibitor of a pro-apoptotic uh, form rather than an inhibitor of the anti-apoptotic form. But that's just speculation at this point. We need to do the experiments to, to see if that's true. Uh, here's just another example of examining a small molecule protein target interaction. Uh, now we're creating base edits across the gene PARP1, uh, which is, of course has a tremendous clinical, uh, uh, clinical impact. Uh, in this case, we, it is known already that loss of function mutations of PARP1 lead to resistance to, in this case, uh, telazoprib, uh, which is why the uh, nonsense mutation shown in, in yellow enrich. Uh, but we do find, and we also find some, some point mutations that enrich as well as some point mutations that deplete, indicating that these are mutations that now sensitize the cells to further PARP inhibition. Uh, here's another example of sort of the fine level of detail one can get out of these base editor screens. So here's, uh, in this case, uh, we are uh, following up with five different uh, PARP inhibitors. And in this case, one particular guide RNA introduces a, a glycine to lysine uh, mutation that sensitizes the cells to four of the five PARP inhibitors, but doesn't affect uh, the, the uh, readout with, with neuroperib. However, at this same amino acid position, uh, if instead of uh, mutating to lysine, we mutate to glutamic acid, uh, now PARP is, is again susceptible uh, to, to inhibition by all five of these small molecules. So you can really see at, at the amino acid level, uh, just differences in, in activity that, that really only emerge when, when one's looking at uh, base set or at, at amino acid level data. Uh, now, of course, the, the only uh, genes we care about are only those that are, are drug targets. Uh, BRCA1 is, of course, the poster child uh, for a uh, gene with tremendous clinical impact where understanding the variants is, is going to be very important uh, to driving clinical decisions. Uh, so here's an example of a tiling screen across BRCA1. Uh, note here uh, that multiple different guide RNAs that introduce missense mutations, the ones that are most depleted, tend to be uh, at the end terminus. Uh, what's shaded in gray here is one of the particularly important domains of, of BRCA1. So it's perhaps unsurprising that the most deleterious point mutations uh, show up in, in this region. Uh, we can then compare uh, the uh, looking at ClinVar. We can look at mutations that we predict to generate with our base editor screens uh, that are either uh, indicated as pathogenic in ClinVar or as benign in ClinVar, uh, and see that the base editor screens do a pretty good job of distinguishing those two categories. Uh, we can do the same thing for BRCA2, and, and indeed one could think about doing this for pretty much every gene for which you have a good uh, assay for it. Uh, and again, with, with BRCA2, uh, here, here's its most important domain uh, shaded here towards the seat terminus. And this is where we see most of the most deleterious uh, missense mutations. And again, doing that same uh, sensitivity specificity analysis in relation to ClinVar uh, showed that, shows that these screens are recapitulating uh, what's shown there to a reasonably good degree. I want to give one more example of a, of a, of a screen. And this is one where uh, rather than tiling across a gene of interest, we actually generated a library that targeted approximately 3,000 genes uh, to introduce base edits that were found in, in ClinVar, whether they're annotated as benign uh, or pathogenic, or of course, the biggest class, variants of unknown significance. Where we took that library and we either did the screen with the base editor, or we performed a counter screen uh, where we took those same guides and paired them with nuclease active Cas9, so presumably creating knockout alleles. And the, the quadrant I'm most interested in is this one down here. So these are guide RNAs uh, that don't show any effect uh, when, when you presumably knock out the gene with the nuclease, but however, do show a strong growth effect uh, when one introduces a base edit. So these are potentially gain of function mutations or dominant negative mutations. And, and just to give one example of that, uh, here's a guide RNA that is predicted, we haven't validated this yet, but is predicted to introduce a glycine to serine mutation uh, in this gene TUB4A, which is one of the uh, components of tubulin. Uh, now the, the hypothesis here is that 
uh, the G2, G244S mutation uh, prevents the ability of these alpha and beta tubulins uh, to, to form in, into the full filament. Uh, however, when you knock out tub 4A, there are other tubs uh, that can substitute for it. However, if you introduce the mutation and this G244S is still expressed, uh, then it acts as, as a dominant negative and, and the filaments can't form. Uh, now, of course, one limitation of the base editor screens as presented so far is coverage. Uh, in, in what I've shown, we've hooked up the base editor to uh, Cas9 that, that uh, recognizes the wild type PAM of NGG. Uh, however, we've been developing assays to really look at as all these variants of Cas9 are being developed uh, to see, well, what are their, what is their PAM specificity in an unbiased way? And uh, if their PAM specificity looks broader and but, but still maintains good activity, could we use it for base editor screens? So this is an example. Uh, now these are data from a nucleus assay, not a base editing assay, uh, where we find, uh, unsurprisingly, uh, that the, the best PAM for wild type Cas9 is NGG. Uh, however, the Cas9 NG uh, variant, which was developed several years ago, uh, does a pretty good job uh, at, at most NG PAMs. I mean, you can now I'll, I'll point out two points. Uh, first, you know, this is not as uh, the blue is not as as dark uh, as it is over here. So there is a loss of of some off target of some on target activity, and some of the you know not all NG PAMs are created equal. Some uh, are, are more preferred than others. But if you just use these arbitrary cutoffs of what fraction of guide RNAs are active, uh, so that's, that's what's plotted here, what fraction of guide RNAs with that PAM show activity, uh, you see that with wild type Cas9, 16, guide, uh, 16 PAMs are active, whereas with Cas9 NG, 18 are active, but there is a big increase in the number of, of PAMs that are accessible in this intermediate range of activity. So worth screening, uh, but knowing that one is taking a bit of a hit in on target activity. So we did some screens with this, now using, again, our MCL1 library. Uh, so first, what's shown here is for the guides that have an NGG PAM, uh, we see pretty darn consistent activity uh, when they're either hooked up to wild type BE3 or now this Cas9 NG variant of BE3, uh, pretty good correlation. Uh, and I think what, what particularly uh, striking is then when one looks at the results of the screen, you can really see now this is so this is each dot along the length of MCL1, just how much better coverage one has when using these expanded PAM variant Cas proteins. Uh, and certainly, you know, one might not want to follow up if, if one did a primary screen, might not want to follow up on this dot per se, because it's one dot on its own. However, here uh, now, you know, one would one would follow up on that with increased confidence because there are multiple uh, examples showing that, okay, this is an area where, where something interesting is happening, uh, in this case, in, in the drug resistance direction. So just uh, to put a number on like, well, how much coverage are we getting? So this is using BRCA1 as a, as a avatar protein, I guess. Uh, so just with wild type C base editor, uh, you're able to introduce a point mutation into about 12% of the BRCA1 protein. Uh, however, if you uh, were to use an NG base editor hooked up to either CBE or ABE, you're now able to modify over 80% of, you're able to create a change in, in over 80% of the amino acid residues. I don't have time to present our work with A-base editors, uh, but suffice it to say, they're, uh, the newer generation are looking pretty good uh, as, as screening tools in our hands, and I hope to be able to share those results uh, in, in another forum sometime soon. Uh, of course, the variants for Cas9 keep coming. Uh, so this is uh, a paper from last year, just last year from Ben Kleinstiver's group. Uh, where they evolved a ver they engineered a version uh, that also recognizes uh, essentially just the NG uh, variant. And here's a direct comparison using the same assay, same guides, everything is as close to the same as possible. Uh, first, you can see that uh, SPG is a little more black and white, or excuse me, uh, blue and white uh, in terms of the activity of, of what PAMs it recognizes. Uh, and when one just compares directly, uh, so here are active PAMs in the top right, inactive PAMs in the bottom left. Uh, you can see that there are a couple PAMs where we do get a little bit more activity with the SPG variant. So I would imagine that our screens going forward are likely to uh, rely more on SPG than Cas9 NG, but in the end, they, they do perform pretty similarly. Uh, so two conclusions, really. Uh, first, I would argue that uh, you know the, the base editing screens to look at small molecule protein interactions are very, very powerful. And I would argue that at this point, it, it's drug discovery malpractice 
not to find a resistance mutation to the putative target of, your, of a small molecule. So phenotypic screens are great, uh, but oftentimes at the end of a screening campaign, you have a small molecule and you don't really know what its target is. And that path can be very long and complicated. Uh, and I think that uh, a really great gold standard is finding a, 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 a drug resistant point mutation in your putative target. And I think that base setter screens can really accelerate that. Uh, but just as the example of, of BRCA1 uh, indicated, uh, there are hundreds of thousands of variants of unknown significance listed in ClinVar, and that's only going to grow uh, over time as, as more and more patients, for whatever reason, have their, have their genome sequenced. Uh, and I think there is some low-hanging fruit here. So the cancer dependency map uh, has identified thousands of genes with growth phenotypes uh, in various cell lines. That, that's, uh, here's a plot of that down here, uh, where there are 3,000 genes that show a strong growth effect uh, in at least five cell lines out of the several hundred that have been screened. Uh, so I think this represents a potentially useful resource uh, for doing a bunch of base editor screens and really starting to understand well, what are, you know, are there, are there to build a catalog of loss of function mutations uh, across a whole spectrum of genes where the assay is relatively straightforward, just, just a growth assay. Uh, so with that, uh, I really want to thank uh, everyone involved in this work, the R&D team and the GPP, uh, especially Ruth Hanna. She spearheaded these efforts, uh, but none of this could be done without a, a whole team approach. Uh, so in red are, are the folks that are in the lab and blue are the folks that are behind the computer. Uh, and really, uh, it, it, it takes all of that uh, to, to do these screens and to make some progress. And with that, I'm happy to go live and answer questions. Thank you so much.